let me uh, acknowledge the welcome to country that uh, Janet made on behalf of her people and the clan from which she comes. And I acknowledge them uh, most sincerely and thank her for, for the welcome. I uh, also acknowledge that we are in the city of Glenora, uh, where we're gathered, and it's located on the traditional state of the Yalakup Wallam clan of the Bumwara. And I thank you for that welcome very much. I want to acknowledge if, uh, not only the politicians that are here, but a special family friend, uh, Mr. Bill Conlon and his lovely wife, Linda, and Marie's sister. Bill and I go back to the days of Monobay in the Western Districts uh, when I was a little scrawny kid coming from the north to go to the secondary school. Also, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, the uh, Supreme Court judge who's here, who at the time was a, uh, a barrister at the Melbourne Bar who fought for the Arab. And uh, won a very difficult uh, title claim against my choice. Um, so I want to acknowledge uh, my, my dear friend. Um, but we're here tonight to honour the legacy and life of Marek Edelman, a true hero. Although he would uh, always reject that epitaph, to examine Edelman's early life is to know the banality of evil, to plumb the depths of depravity which human beings can descend, and to understand what Edelman himself described as a strongly depressing handicap, the feeling that one could perish instantly not as a result of any particular activity, but as a beaten and humiliated, not a human being, but a Jew. It is also to wonder at the bravery of those like Edelman who dare to defy their oppressors, yet to understand as he did, that heroism did not characterise exclusively those who took up arms. As he said, it was much easier to die in battle, being able to pick the time and place of one's death. Easier, that is, than for someone stripped naked in a gas chamber or standing at the edge of a mass grave waiting for a bullet to the head. The death of those 300,000 Jewish people who were dispatched to Trelinska from the Warsaw Ghetto, he said that we were far more heroic. What is it in the human condition that makes men, because it's always men who are worse than, so despise those who are different? And why is it that the rest can blindly ignore and then later choose to erase the record of the atrocities that ensured from hatred of difference. I never knew the story of Marek Edelman until I was invited to deliver this lecture, which marks the centenary of his birth and the 10th anniversary of his death. But that story and the title of this lecture, The Road to Reconciliation, have led me to reflect on some commonalities between the experience of the Polish Jew people, Jewish people, and the Aboriginal people of Australia. Not that I would want or dare to appropriate or trade on the history of the millions of Jewish people who perished in Poland in the 1940s. It just seemed to me that there are some common factors here. There's the exclusion of a minority group 
and the refusal to accommodate difference. There's the forced separation of families, although for very different reasons. And there's the horror of massacre and extermination. These are the stories of determined, there are the stories of the determined resistance against all odds, hopeless and heroic. And finally, there's the denial of history, the refusal to acknowledge wrongs of the past. We all need to know about our history before there can be any true reconciliation. There has to be recognition of human beings, not as flora and fauna, but as integral to the common humanity we all share. A recognition of the richness of the unique cultures and traditions from which we separately come. In this country, the education curriculum has failed to teach us our true history. They have failed to teach us the critical value of recognising the First Nations as an essential step towards true reconciliation of our nation. And that's why the Uluru Statement from the Heart called for a Makarata Commission to supervise the process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling. Truth that has been denied us. So we must prepare for truth telling about how this country was settled and colonised, and it may be challenging for some of us. We have not had the justness of hearing and telling our stories to honour those who have long gone and been disregarded, although I acknowledge we're slowly picking up on that in Josh's recognition of William Cooper's great recognition and of the other great uh, leader back in the day when white folks first came to this part of the world. Lieutenant James Cook sailed from Portsmouth in 1768 to the Southern Hemisphere and he was armed with secret orders from the Lord of the Admir Admiralty not to open it until he was well into his journey. And for the record, it's worth quoting that order verbatim. You are likely to observe the genius, temper, disposition, and number of the natives. And if there be any, an endeavour by all proper means to cultivate a friendship and alliance with them, and make them presence of such trifles as they might value, inviting them to traffic and show them every kind of civility and regard, taking care, however, not to suffer yourself to be surprised by them, but to be always upon your guard against any accident. You're also, with the consent of the natives, to take possession of convenient situations in the country in the name of the King of Great Britain. And if you find the country uninhabited, take as first discoverers and possessors. Of course we know that Cook did claim land for Great Britain without the consent of the natives. And in spite of his observation that Australia was inhabited, the instructions to Cook remained secret until 1928, 160 years after it sailed in the endeavour, by which time Australia was well and truly settled. Thus were laid the foundation of the great uh, lie of Terranotius, which endured as a legal fiction until 1993, when the High Court handed down the Mabo decision, finally recognising the prior occupation and ownership of First Nations peoples. We are yet to fully realise the practical consequences of that judgment. 
the recognition, the restitution and the reconciliation. We need to come to grips with the truth about what Australia is founded upon. The creation of the Warsaw Ghetto was a great lie too, sold as it was by the Nazis as a resettlement project, offering jobs and opportunities with loaves of bread to sweeten the journey to Trollinka. And so great was the lie that the removal by trains were merely a, trans a transfer to a work camp, that many Jewish people simply refused to believe <coughs> that the Germans could even contemplate a solution so comprehensive and final as the Holocaust. It is the record of this country that Aboriginal people too were forcibly removed from their country into reserves ostensibly for their own good and protection from marauding mobs. In reality, the removal was, meant, was a means of subjugation and an attempt by the colonists to expunge the very essence of Aboriginal essence. People from many different Aboriginal nations were herded into these places, alien for each of them and unable to continue to enjoy their traditional culture because it was so rooted in the lands from which they had been displaced. And as in the Warsaw Ghetto, disease and pestilence took a heavy toll. I've been profoundly moved having read uh, Edelman's writings of life and death in the Warsaw Ghetto. And tonight I've been further impressed by other comments made about this extraordinary person. His essence is hard to capture for someone like me, but I would say he was a good man, a modest man, and a keen observer of the human condition. The senseless loss of innocent life would have pained him immensely. He has, he has written to the... He has written that when the Germans occupied Warsaw in 1939, they found those who remained in the Jewish political and social world were in a state of complete chaos and disintegration. In such conditions, he writes, it was easy for the Germans to dominate the population from the very beginning by breaking their spirits through persecution and by invoking a state of passive submission in their midst. Hillman's words have a great resonance for me when I reflect upon our own history. Knowing now the courage and fatalistic resistance of the, U of the Jewish combat organisation which he helped to command, has led me to recall the exploits of those Aboriginal people from my own country who rose up against the invading pastors who were intent on occupying traditional lands. The story of Jundamara, who engaged in bloody combat against the police and white cavalry in the West Kimberley region in the 1890s, has always captivated me. Stories like Jandamara put a lie to the enduring myth that First Nations peoples offered only passive resistance to the occupation of their lands. But beyond the descendants of his wonderful people, the story of Jandamara remained largely unknown for more than a century until it was revived in a book by Banjo Wurrumara and Howard Peterson which won the West Australian Premier's Award for non-fiction in 1996. So did the story of the Warsaw Ghetto, the uprising and the role of Marek Edelman and his fellow patriots in the Jewish combat organisation. That too had remained buried for de decades. That is until a solidarity journalist, Hannah Kroll, published a series of interviews with him in 1976. 
And one reviewer has noted in her book that her book exploded like an SOS flare when it was first when it first appeared. The suppression of history is a characteristic not just of totalitarian, totalitarian regimes. The great Australian anthropologist Bill Stanner coined the term the great Australian science in his 1968 Boyer lectures to describe the exclusion of an Aboriginal dimension from Australian history. And let me quote, he says, it is a structural matter, a view from a window which has been carefully placed to exclude a whole quadrant of the landscape, Stanner wrote. What may well have begun as a simple forgetting of other possible views turned on the habit and over time into something like a cult of forgetfulness practiced on a national scale. We have been able so far, we have been able for so long to disremember the Aborigines that we are now hard pressed to keep them in mind even when we most want to do so. Then it continued. It's very resonant of some of the commentators we see in the press these days why First Nations should be recognised for their unique position. But not only does this silence persist today, it's a condition that the Prime Minister himself seems to cherish and foster with his champion of the quiet Australians. But it's a dangerous condition, one that cannot be allowed to endure. Mark Edelman never stayed quiet, and he paid a price for that. In his 80s, he incurred the wrath of the Israeli government and many public survivors of the war living in Israel, when he wrote an open letter to the Palestinian resistance leaders. Although he rebuked the Palestinians for their attacks on Jewish civilians, his critics were angry that in his letter he never used the word terrorism. And because he said both Palestinians and the State of Israel must alter their approach. Otherwise there'd be more needless death of innocent peoples on both sides. Most Jews who had managed to escape to the West before and after the war chose not to return to Poland because of the Soviet occupation. Many more fled during the anti-Semite purges of the 19, 1968. But Edelman chose to remain. He became known as the one who stayed behind. Someone, he said, had to stay with all those who had perished. You don't leave and abandon the memory of them. In his 60s, by then a distinguished cardiologist, he maintained his rage against the state having aligned himself with the Solidarity Movement. He refused to take part in the grand ceremony organised by the government to mark the 40th anniversary in April 1983 of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. In a public statement he said, to celebrate our anniversary here where social life is dominated throughout by humiliation and coercion would be to deny our fight. It would mean participating in something contrary to its ideals. It would be an act of cynicism and contempt. On the occasion of the 40th anniversary, Edelman was detained under house arrest for his own protection, the government said. 
The only person whom the cordon of police around his house allowed through was the journalist Anna Corral, whose writing about Edmund and the horrors of the Warsaw Ghetto had shocked the nation in 1976. As Poland has wrestled with this dark history of anti-Semitism, so too must we confront our own dark history. Until we as a nation can learn about and come to terms with the reality that Aboriginal people have been dispossessed and acknowledge that they have never ceded their sovereignty, nor till then, not till then could we begin the real business of reconciliation. The road to reconciliation has been long and winding, paved with great intentions, but always blocked at vital junctures by those who lack vision and generosity. We're at one of those junctures right now. It's been 28 years since I was invited by Prime Minister Bob Hawke to be the first chairman of the Reconciliation Council, a post which I had to renounce five years later because of my disillusionment about the approach to First Nations affairs under Prime Minister John Howard. Hawke established the Council for Reconciliation, having failed to deliver on his pledge at the 1988 Barunga Festival to negotiate a treaty with First Nations. In the time since, the reconciliation journey has been torturous. Many young voters today are unaware of that history, and older voters have simply forgotten or are exhausted by the protracted nature war have simply just given up and tuned out. We had the expert panel on recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution with Prime Minister Julia Gillard, established in 2010, and which I co-chaired with the eminent uh, lawyer, Mr Mark Liebler. We consulted widely and presented our report in January 2012. Our focus was on change to the Constitution to reconcile Australia and recognise First Nations. We proposed a new Section 51A to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders prior occupation of Australia and acknowledge their continuing relationship with their traditional lands and waters. We also proposed a new Section 116A to prevent discrimination on the grounds of race, colour, ethnic or national origin. Those proposals went nowhere. Since then, we have had three select committees of the Parliament which have considered constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The first reported in 2013 and the second in 2012, uh, 15. And between the reports of those uh, two joint committees, we had the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples Act of Recognition and a review panel. Then we had the appointment of the Referendum Council in December 2015 by Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. And Mr Legal co-chaired this council as well. And I was his co-chair for a limited time until I became a senator in March 2016. The discussion on reconciliation at this juncture took a fork in the road. The Noel Pearson idea of the voice of the Parliament as a consequence of a deal he broken with the Concons, and against that, the acceptance of the recommendations of the expert panel, which I've referred to. The Council consulted exhaustively 
through a series of regional dialogues before the Uluru Convention in May 2017 and reported to Prime Minister Turnbull and Opposition Leader Phil Shorten a month uh, later. The Council said its recommendations for constitutional and extra constitutional recognition were modest, reasonable, unifying and capable of attracting the necessary support of the Australian people. And let me, let me remind you of how media that ask was. The statement had three appeals. This is the Uluru statement. A First Nations voice to the Parliament enshrined in the Constitution its scope and function to be determined by the Parliament. A Makarata Commission to supervise the process of agreement making and truth telling, again in the power of the Parliament or the Government to determine. It was an appeal also to the Australian people. It wasn't just to the politicians. So no one is exempt from response to this matter. Labor remains committed to these three principles, but the Morrison government has already decided that entrenchment of a voice to the parliament is off the table. Instead, the government is proceeding with legislation of entities to represent First Nations peoples to government, not to parliament, to governments at regional and national levels. The Minister for Indigenous Australians at least acknowledges the need for a co-design process for the legislation. As for a Makarata Commission, agreement making and truth telling, who knows where this government is? It's forever the prisoner of its right wing standards. Some might think that the government's intransigence in not wanting to enshrine the voice of the Constitution puts Labor in a difficult position, given that we're holding to the principles of the Uluru Statement from the heart. And let's face it, it is a wedge at play here. If Labor doesn't go along with the government's proposal, merely to legislate a voice to government, will be accused of being wreckers and heartbreakers. Well, that's not our game. We're going to see how the co-design process announced last week and led by Professor Marcia Langton and uh, Tom Kelman, how that plays out. And then we'll formulate our position. We'll take our cue from First Nations people who again are being asked to engage in another process and another round of consultations as if they haven't already made their preference clear. And this time, with the prospect of entrenching the voice of the Constitution off the table. The round of regional dialogues that preceded the Uluru Convention was the most comprehensive engagement with First Nations people since ATSI was abolished back in 2004. And after all that talk, the Convention settled for a voice to be enshrined in the Constitution. Personally, I was disappointed. The outcome was as minimal as it was, but I accept it. But I do know that there are early signs that the government's weak need proposed proposal to legislate the voice is already under attack. The Central Land Council, which I used to head up in the 1980s, is a truly democratic body representing Aboriginal traditional owners in Central Australia. The CLC met at an outstation near Uluru last week, celebrating the closing of the climb of Uluru. And they resolved to demand that the voice be protected in the Constitution. 
We are tired of governments changing laws that affect our lives, they said in the statement. Our voice needs to be embedded in the foundations of this nation. And from our own country in Western Australia, the Kimberley Land Council has said the proposal, the proposal to legislate a voice is a backward step, a contradiction of the Uluru Statement. These early rumblings don't augur well for the government's agenda, but Labor will wait and see. And if First Nations reject the government's intention to legislate, uh, the voice, who could blame it? It'll be this government that will have broken the hearts of the First Nations peoples yet again. A government that has in its ranks uh, people like Senator James McCarthy, McGrath, sorry, Senator James McGrath, who even last week was still peddling the line that a voice would represent a special chamber. At least Barnaby Joyce had the good grace to apologise for his having labelled the voice a third chamber of the parliament. The fact is, a majority of the population, including some classically conservative and establishment people, like former Chief Justices Murray Gleeson and Robert French, support a voice to the parliament being enshrined in the constitution. The conundrum has been whether legislation preceded a referendum and those who insisted the reversal of this position have got to let the government know of their displeasure because the government has taken the referendum, that option, off the agenda. Indeed, a majority, I believe, of Australians support the notion of a treaty with First Nations. But the coalition is light years away from that goal. A treaty is a means towards reconciliation. But first must come recognition and acknowledgement of the truth of it about our relationship. It would go towards confirming the legacy of our nation but it would not be an end in itself. Real national reconciliation would have many dimensions beyond the practical legacies of First Nations and the descendants of the settlers. I'm talking about the social, cultural and political dimensions that affect all Australians and their contemporary diversity. Human beings have got to reconcile with human beings. Human beings have got to reconcile with nature. And human beings have got to reconcile with their creators. Yet this coalition government shows no willingness to contemplate, let alone embrace, those larger challenges to our current one-dimensional society. Rather for them, the quick fix of a voice right prescribed in law, but not in the Constitution. I wonder what Marek Edelman would have thought about this topo that grips this country. On that note, let me remind us, let me remind ourselves why we're here tonight. To honour Edelman's extraordinary life and remarkable achievements. Having now praised myself of the Edelman story, I am left, left with many enduring impressions and memories. Memories, of course, of the horrific atrocities committed by the occupying German forces against the 400,000 Jewish residents of the Warsaw Ghetto. But one other scene, less traumatic, sticks in my mind. It is the image of Edelman, detained in his house in April 1983, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the uprising 
he had helped to lead. The journalist, Hannah Corral, who was with him that day in his house, surrounded by police cars, has written that Edelman was sitting at a table set for a fancy dinner that never happened. When Edelman was spending this day cut off from the world, not even for a moment did he have the feeling that he was alone, she recalls. On the contrary, he had the feeling of belonging to the world, to that world of fair and brave people, and beautiful and calm. Merrick Edelman was a patriot on the right side of history and on the right side of politics. And I'll leave you with those thoughts and his observation that hate is easy, love requires effort. Thank you.